Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as per usual, this video is time index. Underneath, if you click on the arrow thingy, you'll be able to see all the different time indexes, and then you can jump ahead to whatever topic you want. And we're going to be covering a variety of topics today on orchestral bass drum, including different types of uh, things you can use to strike it, different sounds you can get out of it, different ways to set it up, etc. But uh, it's certainly not limited to that, but definitely including that. Uh, first off, I just want to say that by popular demand, uh, the Senegalese shirt is back. So I did a video about how to repair chimes in this shirt and it attracted some attention. And I was asked to do another video wearing this shirt, so here it is. And so let's get to it. So I'm going to be using for this video my orchestral bass drum, which is an early 1970s vintage Ludwig 26-inch diameter drum that I did a fair amount of work on the shell and the hoops of. And then I also installed um, Remo Fiber Skin third generation FA base heads on it. The first and second generations of the Fiber Skin had problems with flaking and peeling, but the third generation heads are just about indestructible. And um, they also make the drum sound quite a bit larger than it actually is, which is really nice. So, I'll talk a little bit about some basic playing first. For, um, you can use bass drum mallets, obviously, and there are a lot of manufacturers that make really good bass drum mallets, like uh, uh, Vic Firth makes a good one, Innovative Percussion makes good ones, and Tom Gagger makes really good ones. For the purposes of this video, since my microphone isn't excellent, I'm going to use really soft timpani mallets. These are Hinger Touch Tone Yellows, and I'm going to use these just because they will accentuate the uh, tone differences in the bass drum when I play them. But we're also going to talk about using chord vibraphone mallets, hard felt mallets that are similar to marching bass mallets, but not quite the same, uh, blastics, a frayed blastic, and we'll even talk about uh, using snare drum sticks on the instrument as well. Um, alrighty, so based on, so um, once you've decided what kind of mallet you're going to use, and it's, um, and, and you know, that decision is now done, it's either made for you because you only have one, or you've made the decision, there are still two parts of the sound that you can change on the bass drum. There's the attack and there's the decay, which is sometimes referred to as the ring, but I refer to it as the decay because the ring will decay and taper down over time, regardless of how um, quickly you make it do that or whether you just leave it. So in terms of the attack, what you're gonna find is that you will always get the least attack on the outside edge of the instrument. You can hear, that's a very soft attack. The further to the center you go, harder the attack you will get. And that's pretty much all you have to know about attack, further away or in the center and anywhere in between. It's a sliding scale, it's grayscale, it's not just black and white. So there's your attack. Regarding your ring, the instrument, just like timpani, and actually this is uh, even much more pronounced on timpani, but on bass drum, the instrument is always ringing more on the outside of the instrument and less in the middle. So if I dampen in the middle, I'm not cutting off the sound very much. If I dampen on the outside, I am cutting off the sound quite a bit. So you can start by just um, play the instrument and then with no dampening, that's the most decay, and then play with one finger attached, and then with two fingers attached, and then with three fingers attached, and then with four fingers attached, and then with five fingers attached, and then with your entire hand on the instrument, and then with your knee on the instrument, something you can do for this, if you're using a scissor stand, this is a good scissor stand, but some scissor stands don't actually support the weight of your leg in addition to the weight of the drum. So in that case, you can use a chair. You can put the chair wherever you want so it's not really in your way, and you can put your foot fairly far back on the chair, press your knee into the uh, outside of the instrument, um, then you got that and you can also put your hand on it. and if you want a really short sound you can put your hand on the other side so that's a little bit about all the different kinds of sounds you can get um, and additionally obviously you can get maximum decay with maximum attack or contact rather you can get maximum decay with minimum contact you can get minimum decay with minimum contact and you can get minimum decay with maximum contact. So all those sounds and all the different sounds in between you can get with different 
different approaches to dampening and different approaches of uh, playing zones with the mallet. So that's a little bit about different sounds, um, but in terms of the appropriateness of the sound, you're not usually going to get that information explicitly written into your score. Um, percussion note lengths, I've talked about this in other videos, but note lengths and percussion battery writing don't tend to be as explicitly correct and meticulous as they are for wind players. Where like if you have a quarter note and you're a wind player or a string player, you're going to play for the duration of that quarter note, then you're going to stop and then switch on to the next thing. Whereas in percussion, sometimes the note length doesn't actually imply what kind of articulation you should use. You don't have articulation markings and sometimes uh, the note length should be, in terms of how long the instrument rings for, it should be shorter than what's written on the page. So for example, if you're playing a march and your job is to keep the beat, then this sound is not going to generate enough clarity for the ensemble to be able to buy into what you're doing with tempo. So you're probably going to want to have a lot more uh, attack contact and a lot, um, you know, a lot less uh, ring afterwards. Uh, whereas if you're playing, um, you know, if there's this really beautiful, serene piece of music and the phrases are just, you know, extended and, and really I mean, half the audience is in tears because it's so gorgeous and beautiful and then the bass drum comes in for one note at the climactic moment, then this probably is not the most appropriate sound that you can get out of the instrument. You'll probably want something a little more graceful and, um, you know, um, um, uh, full sounding uh, with less contact and with more ring slash decay afterwards. So that's a little bit about how you can make that um, judgment call for yourself. And we'll talk about some other cool things. So next thing we'll talk about, I'll just get the chair out of the way. We're going to talk about rolling on the bass drum. Generally you want to use soft mallets and generally you want to be rolling on the outsides of the instrument. I like to roll um, uh, on opposite ends so that it's kind of like dropping a rock in a pond. So you drop your rock here, the ripples go out. You drop your rock here, the ripples go out which means the ripples could travel more distance before they conflict with one another. So you'll get a really nice sustained sound. Without much contact at all, which is what you want when you're rolling, because you're trying to sustain. You'll get a great sound like that. You roll on the outside edges, and you notice that it looks a little bit awkward because I'm using um, a match technique and I have to angle up like this. Otherwise, I'm gonna hit the rim by accident and you don't want that. So this is actually another um, instance, uh, one of the, you know, sort of, one of the instances where traditional technique, snare drum traditional technique for the left hand will come in handy because now instead of doing this, I am just playing like this. There's another video where I actually outline traditional technique and the, um, the positives and the drawbacks of it. I'll also include that link underneath the video so you can check that out as well if you're interested but yeah traditional technique works fine if your instrument is upright if you uh, if your uh, instrument is on a swivel stand and you can change the angle however you want then you don't absolutely have to use traditional technique and you don't even have to use it when you're doing this it just kind of looks awkward and feels not comfortable to do but uh, yeah if your instrument can swivel great this instrument cannot swivel because it's on a scissor stand and I don't feel like owning a 36 inch bass drum. It's just not really necessary. So um, one thing you can do with this instrument is you can actually put it on the scissor stand on a 45 degree angle. Um, but the problem with that is that now part of the weight of the instrument is sitting on the, um, on the other head, the resonant head. Um, so when you roll, you won't get as much ring and you might also get some rattling sound from the stand. Um, one other important tip about rolling is that you really don't want to roll on either side of the drum because you can never be absolutely certain that your playing head and your resonant head are exactly in tune with one another. Um, sometimes some bass drums actually have different heads on one side than the other. Like uh, you know, there's a budget issue or an availability issue, and they put a really nice head on the side that you play but um, the head on the other side is not nice, then your roll is going to sound terrible. So you always want to roll on one side of the instrument only, even though it's not very comfortable, it's going to generate a better result. So that's a little bit about rolling. And let's talk now about some special effects that you can do. So 
a, let's start with a forte piano roll. So I'm going to have a strong attack at the beginning of the roll, and then I'm going to just roll quietly afterwards. So what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to have my non-dominant hand up here, ready to start rolling. I'm going to start with my dominant hand in the center, do a strike, and I'm going to move straight to the outside and roll quietly. So it's going to be this. There's my um, forte piano roll. Now let's do a forte piano crescendo with an abrupt cutoff at the end of it. So what I'm going to do for this is I'm going to have my chair in place, I'm going to fan my leg out like this, and I'm going to start my roll in the center the way I just did. I'm going to start, immediately move to the outside edges, roll, and then crescendo, and then as soon as I'm done rolling, I'm going to uh, get my right hand out of the way, apply my knee, and move my left hand over to the other side. And what I'm doing on the other side is I'm actually applying the mallet like this so that my ring finger and small finger and thumb are against the drum and the thumb and the ring finger are preventing the mallet shaft from vibrating against the drum but the soft head of the mallet is also against the drum so that's what I'm doing on the other side with my left hand I'm just getting my right arm out of the way so that I can dampen so it's going to be this and you can see I also put my right hand there I guess that's just an instinct so that I can dampen really quickly uh, here's another effect we can do forte piano crescendo to an abrupt hard contact ending and a sudden dampening afterwards. So for that, I'm gonna put my foot on my chair, fan my right leg out, strike in the center with the dominant hand, immediately roll to move to the outside. I've already got my non-dominant hand on the outside opposite my dominant hand. I'm going to roll and then I'm gonna crescendo. And then for the end of my roll for my marcato or accents or whatever it is, I'm gonna smack in the center and then do that same dampening thing that I just described to you. So that's gonna be. And there's my forte piano crescendo to an abrupt marcato with a cutoff afterwards. Um, let's talk about some of the different mallets that you can use to strike the instrument. So you can use harder mallets. This is like a the chord vibraphone mallet is obviously going to sound quite a bit harsher. Um, these are hard felt mallets, uh, Ludwig 345s, they're quite old, I don't think they make them anymore, but they're very similar to a Vic Firth T5 Ultra Staccato or something like that. So um, you can use those to get some contact and some rhythm if you want to. You can also use blastics, so like, you know, here's a blastic for example, and you get the kind of the thwacking sound of it. Plastics is you can actually take the ends of them and chop them up with a, a razor blade and then sort of spread them apart with your hands so that they fan out like this and then then you get that really really bristly thwacking effect as you play it might be useful for something um, I'm sure that a composer has written for it and if a composer happens to be watching this video and they haven't written for that they might now be tempted to do so uh, but the harder the mallet you're using, or the more harsh the, the contact of the mallet is, the more important it is that you have a head like a fiber skin on it so that it's going to be durable and it's not going to get damaged um, while you're playing. And particularly if you want to use snare drum sticks, which is generally inadvisable, um, you actually can use snare drum sticks on, this, on these heads. Uh, I don't ever really do that because I find I can generally get enough contact sound with chord mallets or heartfelt mallets or you can use marimba mallets if you want whatever you want to do I wouldn't recommend glockenspiel mallets but uh, you can do that um, so another thing you can do if you wanted to try to you know use two mallets and get the sort of taiko drumming-esque effect where uh, you have a lot of contact and um, and not very much rain you can you know put some dampening material on it if, if you want lots of contact you're going to be playing in the center anyway so your dampening material can be further to the outside I'm just using a standard towel for this and then uh, the nice thing is that the other side of the instrument is already being dampened because it's on a scissor stand if you have a swiveling instrument that won't be the case but uh, Contact with like almost no ring at all after the notes. 
Um, to illustrate what, the way that would work on a swiveling instrument, I'll set up my instrument horizontally. This uh, scissor stand has these nice little felty thingies on it so that I can set the rim of the instrument right on the felt and then it, it doesn't, uh, it, do, it always takes a little bit of a trial and error to get that worked up. And then you're guaranteed to not um, have the wooden rims right on the metal being driven down into the metal as you impact the instrument. So now the underside, the resonant head of the instrument is um, going to be ringing because it's not being dampened by the scissor stand. I'll put my dampening out here and you can hear that the um, that the instrument actually is, you know, there's a little bit of after the after the fact because the resonant head is ringing underneath. Um, chord vibraphone mounts are going to sound even harsher than that. And then snare drum sticks, once again, uh, only use snare sticks if you're gonna be really sure of what you're doing um, and that you have a good head on your instrument. Otherwise, you'll actually damage it, but... Uh, not sure how much you can hear how that tone contrasts. Uh, it does contrast a fair amount in terms of what I'm hearing right in front of me, but I really don't think it's worth it if you're playing in a live room like an acoustic concert hall or a church or something like that because um, by the time the walls and the ceiling and the floor have treated the sound uh, and turned it into a more reverberant sound and the sound actually makes it out to the audience, um, you're not really going to notice, like the from the audience's perspective, they're not going to notice much of a difference between these and these and uh, it's easier on the instrument to use something like this. So that is what I would recommend doing. And that is a little bit about orchestral bass drum. Pretty sure I covered everything that I wanted to cover in there. Uh, if you have any questions or suggestions for different videos I should do, please comment underneath or type my first and last name into a Google search. I'm very easy to find. My phone number and email address are always right there. And have an awesome afternoon and go Senegal. <laughs>